William Riker is not a Nigerian. <laughs> okay. William Riker is not a Nigerian. Now, he has federalism and politics. He says that federalism is more often than not the, pro the, the product of a bargain that people freely enter into, which they themselves negotiate. And that what emerges is a project that all of them find out. In using project, let me just be clear. I don't belong to the school in this country that says the Nigeria project. We have a country, a state, a nation called Nigeria. It is not a project. Okay? You know, I have not seen any other country in the world that calls itself a project. So please, when I use project, I use that in relation to federalism and federalism only. Okay? Now, Riker says that people who come together to bargain and to negotiate what manner of federalism they want are those that then give rise to the peculiar flavor that that federal system has. But he says, in bargaining, it is not likely that the things that make them come together will change if that federal system is going to survive. Please keep this in mind because I'm going to conclude on a note of what in political science we call games theory. And I'll get back to bargaining. Now, you see, federalism works in many instances, but in many other instances, it does not work. It fails. In fact, there are more failed federations in the world than successful federations. That's the story. Federalism is a very delicate system of government. It's a very difficult system to manage, and there are no guarantees. First, they say federalism can be differentiated on the basis of how it originated. So, in America, 13 colonies got together to form a federal union. In Switzerland, the cantons got together to found a union. In Germany, the Landa got together and they have a union. In Canada, the provinces are there. That is the aggregative process of federalizing. The opposite of that is the disaggregative process. And that's where we are, together with India. That Nigeria was a unitary system that was then disaggregated, as it were, for the purposes of federalism. Again, keep this in mind. Because we are going to be arguing, to conclude, that the units that we regard as our constituent units in Nigeria today have no organic existence, have no organic identities. They were imposed, and that's what we are dealing with. So when people call themselves Northerners in Nigeria, they are really not saying anything. They are living up to a category that was defined for them by outsiders. When people call themselves Easterners and Westerners and Southerners, we are products of artificial creations, okay? Now, but also think of it. The ethnic groups that we have in our country today, the names that they bear, the territories that they claim for themselves, all of these things only took roots and got consolidated within these artificial entities that we had as the constituent units of Nigeria. So I dare argue and tell you that even some of those ethnic groups, so-called, are artificial. Okay, now, you're not clapping properly because you're still trying to say, is he saying? <laughs> is he saying? You know that we are not who we claim to be? <laughs> 
you know. Now, in disaggregating federal systems, the stakes are a little higher. In practice, these are more difficult federal systems to govern. The reason is that somebody was citing the Bible a while ago. Does the clay say to its maker, why have you made me so? All the states, all the local governments, all the regions, all of these structures were created by the central government. And you then turn up to the central government to say, we want your power. So you, you think of it. That's, that's, that's a difficult bargain. That's a difficult bargain. You that I created. Remember in 1991 and 1996, many of the states that were created were given 30 million naira to take off by the federal government. So we created you and made you what you are. And then you turn around to look us in the face and say, we want your power. That would be too daring. But that's the difficulty with disaggregating federal systems. Because the central government retains a conception of proprietary rights. These are my creations, and I'll continue to deal with them. So when you have people who, in Nigeria, don't want true federalism, that's the sense. Because when you govern the center and you have created these structures, you think that they are too stubborn. And you cut them to size. Now, because federalism is very difficult and there are no guarantees in different parts of the world, federal systems have invented instrumentalities that will make for some harmony and for survival. So, in the old Soviet Union, they entered in their constitution a clause aligned for secession saying any of the 16 Soviet republics could secede if it no longer considered it necessary to belong to the Union. And they said to Lenin, you want a federal constitution? This is unfederal. Secession is incompatible with federalism. So he says, well, you probably have a point. Why don't you also say that divorce is incompatible with marriage? The fact that there is the possibility that you can invoke the divorce clause if the marriage is no longer working does not lead every wife to say to the husband, I divorce you. Or every husband to say to the wife, I divorce you. But you know that whatever happens in the marriage, you continue to persevere. Knowing that as a last resort, if everything does not work, there's always an exit point. That's how Lenin got those people. And today in Ethiopia, there's a secession clause. Because the Romo, the Tigrians, all of those people feared Amharic domination. And they went back to the Soviet Union, and then they said, look, we can do things with secession. If you ask Ethiopians. But you know, this is just honorific. They say, no, Eritrea was the first you know, uh, member of Ethiopia to activate that clause. Good. So Yugoslavia under Marshal Tito felt we cannot have a good federation if we didn't strengthen our local governments. And so, they introduced something that was new to federal theory. They gave us a three-tier federal system. Nigeria followed suit. Yes, we did. And the world was then saying, there's something to learn from a three-tier federal system. So we have a lot to teach the world. Then in India, in Canada, in Nigeria, 
the central government can activate its emergency powers and take over the governance of a constituent unit. We have seen that. They say, no, that's not federal. But if that's what works for you, it's federal for you. Let's focus on Nigeria. So we became independent in 1960. And so we had three regions. And then we ended up with four regions. And then we had 12 states. And then we had 19. We had 21. We had 36. Today we have 774 local governments. Now, these things didn't come from nowhere. These were things that we sat together, thought through, and decided that that's the way to go. And I have, I have proof for that. We had three regions that we inherited at independence. Each of those regions was autonomous. Autonomous to the point where each one even had a different consulate in London. Can you imagine it? The Western region had its consulate in London. The Eastern region had its consulate in London. The Northern region had its consulate in London, in addition to the Nigerian consulate. So, an observer of the Nigerian federal system at the time said, these are not federating units. These are independent countries in a primitive international system. That's how divided we were. And you know, you couldn't do things in one region if you didn't come from there. It was not for northerners, west for westerners, and east for easterners.